Hi, I'm Danner and I'm an engineering student from Huntsville, Alabama. I'm currently on a mission to convert my family's abandoned shed into an amazing tiny house. In this week's episode, I'm going to be looking at all the issues in making this old shed meet modern building code. Thanks for subscribing. This is Abandoned Shed to Tiny House. So my grandfather, Bert Danner, which is where I got my name by the way, and my grandmother were in construction for most of my life. I was too young when he died to get involved, but my uncle Matthew Danner has been involved with construction most of his life. So I invited him up to the shed today to look at the project and give me some pointers before I met with the Lincoln County building inspector. Thanks for coming, so can you go ahead and tell us what you do for a living? Absolutely, so uh, I currently am an inspector with the state of Alabama. Uh, prior to that, I was an inspector and a director of the inspection department uh, for a local North Alabama County, worked there for 22 years. Also a licensed home builder uh, in an active status. I currently don't build right now, so I don't keep it active. Uh, also a master plumber and master gas fitter. Started out uh, early on uh, with your grandfather actually building houses. He was in the real estate business and then uh, went to the residential construction side and that's kind of how I started when I was very young. So lifelong construction uh, activity. So you do this in Alabama, so what are, how are the laws different in Tennessee? So we're, we're in Lincoln County, Tennessee today, and a little bit uh, different states and different cities have different jurisdictions. So always uh, recommend that you consult with the local uh, authority having jurisdiction or the local inspection department. I believe currently they're on the 2018 International Residential Code, which is one of the International Code Council's uh, codes that are applicable to these type structures. You know, get the local inspection department involved early on, kind of draw up, you know, here's what I've got, take some pictures, go in and meet with them and say, you know, here's my ideas and here's what I want to do just to make sure that everybody's staying code compliant moving forward and so you don't end up doing something that's a mistake and cost you down the road. Keep it cost effective up front. I think we're going to convert this whole overhang into a room and this is going to end up being a kitchen. So we're going to have to grade out the land a little bit and put in a concrete slab. So what are your thoughts about that? So looks like a little change in elevation. So should be able to go through and uh, be able to dig a footing out, uh, bring in some gravel, kind of do a monolithic pour on that and uh, probably raise the pitch of the roof a little bit to get you some ceiling height in the kitchen. Can you explain what a monolithic pour is? So monolithic pour is gonna be a, a type of slab construction that has one pour, so hence the mono. Basically what you would do would be to dig a footing out. Uh, since we've got an existing slab here, dial into the existing slab with some rebar and two-part epoxy to make sure that those two slabs tie together and there's not uh, differential sediment. Uh, go through and form up uh, with uh, wooden forms on the outside. Grade your gravel right in the, in the interior of the slab. Make sure you've got a nice clean footing that's deep enough to carry any applicable loads. And then you pour it all at one time after you've got the vapor barrier down and either your uh, welded wire mesh or if you're using fiber. All right, for the land, what do you think about grading for that? Since in this area we're, you know, a little bit higher, somewhere in the, you know, 12 plus inches, I think that it's going to have to come down several feet, but it looks like you've got some natural uh, swales in this area that can probably uh, go through and start and lower in these areas to carry some of the water around both sides of the structure. Uh, looks like we've got another uh, low area on that other side and uh, just trying to get the water to go around it instead of, uh, instead of through it. So then on this other side, we're doing a similar thing with that side, except this is eventually going to become a little garage. So we're also going to want to pour concrete here. I guess we'll do that monolithic pour. Nice, nice. So depending on whether it's going to be uh, an open carport or an enclosed garage, and that's not something that you've got to make your mind up right now about. Uh, same issue, go through, raise it up, pour a footing, uh, get, your, or get your monolithic slab and footing all poured at one time, and either make the decision to uh, just have post or frame up an exterior wall. But since we've got what's gonna be living space on this side, and then we've got a place to park a garage or a carport, there does have to be some separation between the two. And so eventually that window's gonna end up coming out uh, and also uh, put some type of material on this wall to, to give it the proper fire rating that the code requires. All right, so if you look up at this roof, obviously it's all messed up right now. So we're gonna to have to take this down and rebuild the whole thing. Right. So. Uh, looks like it had some uh, had some water damage from sitting over time. So it looks like the two by sixes that are currently there certainly could be used somewhere else, uh, except maybe the last few at the end uh, have some have some sagging to them that uh, might not be able to use unless it's just for miscellaneous blocking and uh, uh, filler in between some of the walls or make up some headers. 
But uh, yeah, definitely think there's some stuff here that you can use again. Okay, so what do you think about the, the outside of the shed as far as material? Should we wrap it? What do we need to do? So if we're gonna go with a different look than the old T111, I know that uh, some of it's deteriorated ever so slightly, but all in all, it's in pretty good shape. So uh, the T111 essentially acts as the required sheathing for the house uh, to give it the corner bracing and, and those types of code requirements. So as good as it shapes it in, I would probably recommend just simply taking off the corner boards and the trim boards and then going through and wrapping it with whatever uh, choice of whether it's a house wrap or, or a, you know, a Tyvek type product or even if you wanted to give it some more insulating qualities and, and do better on the energy code, maybe go through and do a half inch or, or an inch, uh, a couple of layers of dowel or some type of foam board. Uh, to go around the uh, perimeter of it. And then you could seal your joints and that would help give you another insulation level, keep from, uh, or help with the thermal bridging. We're also thinking maybe instead of doing T111, maybe doing metal siding instead. I think metal's a great idea. It's, uh, it's durable, uh, it's reasonably priced, especially if you're going with a gavel loom, something that was similar to what was on the roof, kind of give it that neat barn feel yeah. and look to it. So uh, yeah, certainly an option and uh, don't, see any, don't see any real issue with that. So we're over here in the backyard and the original reason that my dad wanted to build this tiny house is so that we would have a little place to stay while we were having our house built over here, but that obviously didn't happen. Nice. So one thing I'm wondering is what do we do about utilities to get them to this tiny house in case maybe in the future we want to make the ho another house right there? Good question. So we're a couple of hundred yards off the road and so a couple of things that we've got to talk about getting is power, water and potential internet, uh, television cable, that kind of thing. So I would go through and size the electrical service, not only for the uh, tiny house, but also for a potential future house, at least the conduit size. So uh, you only have to do it once instead of actually pulling two separate services. Uh, suspect the, the tiny house is gonna need 100 amp a minimum, 100 to 200, but 100 should be fine. Depending on the size of the new house, you're gonna be two to 300 amp. So okay. probably looking at at least a 400 amp service. So just need to make sure that the appropriate size conduits put in for that. Uh, ditch can be wide enough to accommodate both the incoming water and incoming electrical. Just have to keep them separated per code requirements and slightly elevate the electrical uh, conduit coming in uh, in that same uh, trench. Since we've got some rise in topography for the water coming off the road, need to make sure that we size the water line large enough so you can step down as you come up and over uh, the topography to make sure that we've got enough pressure PSI at the house right. uh, to have a good functioning system. Yeah. Another option would be to go and consider uh, building off the grid. Not sure what the requirements are uh, in, in this uh, authority that's having jurisdiction, Lincoln County. Uh, definitely again, check with their inspection department and see uh, if that's something that's allowed. But potentially you could go through and uh, with the amount of sunlight that you'd have in this location, uh, potentially do a combination of solar panels, uh, some inverters and uh, battery banks, and potentially we've got some really nice breeze out here. It kind of sits on a hill, and so chances are you might be able to have a wind generator as well. See? Yeah, I got it now. Oh, it's all black snake. That's all yeah. it is. <laughs> Calm down. So you look at his head, you notice his head's not diamond shaped, so you can tell he's a non-venomous. Oh. <laughs> yeah, he's that's what he's this is a, a defense mechanism. Oh so that's how where they go. Yeah. Alright, so yes, yeah, so now that you've seen that snakes can go up under there, do you think we need to fill up Underneath there? Yeah, I think that'd be a great idea. Whenever you go through and you're doing your slab for the carport garage or, or for the kitchen, go through and uh, dig out, uh, give us a little bit more uh, footing underneath uh, those areas, and uh, go ahead and uh, pour that where we can't get any animals, snakes up in there. <laughs> right. <laughs> Looks like you've got your uh, sewer uh, coming out of the building there. Uh, it looks like the slab uh, your dad originally plumbed it inside. So that's a good sign. Had a tree growing in front of it, might have to excavate that stump and maybe have to replace a portion of the line, but that shouldn't be a big deal. And it looks like you got plenty of area for your septic tank out here. Uh, should be some pretty good conditions for uh, the field lines. Always have to get in touch with the uh, local health department uh, in Limestone County here 
and uh, they'll give you some guidance as to how deep, how wide, and how many, what the footage of, of the field lines will have to be in the size tank to meet their requirements. So we met with David Cosby from TDEC. He had to survey the site, analyze the soil, and draw up a plan so he could issue a permit. His job looked a lot easier than it was. We've got a rock pro simply looking for solid rock, which would be uh, the minimum requirement will be 31 inches. This is just a hand auger. We're gonna bore a hole and uh, check it out, see what uh, see what we're looking at when uh, as we go down the soil profile. So that screws in. Yep. It's like a screw. We're looking for clay content. We're looking for drainability, whether the soil is well drained, poorly drained, or. Is it usually this tough? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this isn't anything uncommon. You can take a little bit. Yeah, I kind of want to try it. Go right here. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I've told a lot of folks that before. You see a guy my size putting out that much, it's not a good thing. But oh you're just God. on a rock. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you're doing it. <laughs> I think you're a little stronger than me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you didn't do bad. Hey, I got it to turn a little bit though. Another approval and one step closer to the building permit. All right, Danner, tell me, uh, tell me what your plans are for inside. So this is gonna be the main area. Um, maybe have some couches in here, a little TV, something. It's kind of like your den area then? Yeah. Nice, nice. And then over here, we'll have a little bathroom. There's already a little bit of plumbing done for that that my dad did a long time ago when we built the shed. Nice. And so are the stairs, are they going to remain in the current location or are we going to have to move those? Looks like we might have some potential headroom issues here for the water closet. Yeah, so that's a question I have for you actually. Are these stairs good? Do these meet code? Looking at them uh, short of grabbing the tape measure out, I'm going to say that they're probably not to current okay, code. Tape measure. There he goes, <laughs> putting me on the spot. So. Uh, uh, previous codes would go through and they would require a certain run for the for the stair itself and a certain riser height. They all have to be pretty much consistent and the riser height typically is maximum of seven and three quarter. You can have it as shallow as you like but as long as it's no more than seven and three quarter and so these are ranging right about seven and a half inches and they actually seem to be fairly consistent except maybe a few. So what the what that code is is to allow you to be able to walk up safely and traverse the stairs both at night and during the day when you know you've got good light or bad light just a good feel walking up and down so based off what i'm seeing i don't think we've got the required depth for the tread so it's going to make our stairs a little bit longer so okay. i think that we're probably going to have to go through and and redo the stairs but got some good material here for the actual stringer boards themselves for the uh for the treads themselves, they meet the width requirement, so might be able to potentially reuse these as well. Yeah, so we've noticed on some of these other little Home Depot sheds, the stairs come out and they turn right here. So That's we're right. kind of thinking about redoing them to do something like that. So landings work out great. A uh, couple of things to consider. So minimum stair width is 36 inches in the clear and that's to your finished walls. Uh, and so the stairs currently meet that. Uh, but when you go through and put a landing, the landing has to be at least the width of the stairs and it has to be at least three feet or 36 inches out from the last, what would be the last riser coming out that it lands on. The other issue would be potentially headroom that we're going to run into, headroom height. So you'd measure off the leading nose of the of the stair tread, both at top and bottom, and then draw that imaginary diagonal line between the two. And if anything from the upstairs, whether it be light fixtures or whether it be the framing itself or the finished material of the ceiling, minimum uh, best I can remember is six feet seven inches, but we definitely need to check the 2018 and see if if that number's changed. Okay. So talking about insulation, Danner, got a couple of options. You can hire a, a contractor, an insulation contractor to come in and uh, got a couple of different kinds of foam. Uh, you've got an open cell and a closed cell. Open cell, you can kind of poke your finger through. Gives a little bit, uh, requires uh, more depth for the R value. Uh, closed cell is has a little bit of structural characteristic to it. It seals holes wonderfully. Uh, it doesn't necessarily come all the way out to the face because 
the heat generated from the application of the material, uh, but typically it's you know only halfway uh, to the stud. So a couple of different ideas that you can look at, or it's something that you can actually buy the material and install yourself. Several companies sell what's called a froth pack. It's two separate tanks. It mixes and sprays in the walls. So definitely take a look at that from a cost standpoint to see, see what the pros and cons are. All right, so before we go upstairs and check that out, let's talk about this floor joist up here. So it looks like it was originally framed with two by 10 floor joists, southern yellow pine it appears, and 12 inches on center. So it looks like the overall depth is just under 16 feet, uh, so we should be in pretty good shape. Uh, if we're using the upstairs for like a sleeping area or bedroom, that would require a 30 and 10 pound uh, live load, dead load. At worst case scenario, 40 and 10, so we should be in pretty good shape. All right, let's head upstairs. It's hot up here. <laughs> All right, looks like we got some two by six rafters. Looks like we're 24 inches on center and running a, looks like a two by eight ridge beam. So actually might even be a two by 10 ridge beam. Let's see you tape there, Danner. We're a two by eight. So we're, we're in good shape either way. So thinking about this being a bedroom area, a couple of things. I know that you talked about raising your roofs up on both sides for the carport and for the future kitchen. Sleeping areas, bedrooms require that you have a means of egress. Uh, so a window or a door that meets a certain size requirement. These windows are up here, unfortunately, probably aren't gonna meet. So we're gonna have to do some change outs on the windows. Right. Okay. And so again, we'll look in that 2018 and decide what that code requirement is, it's probably going to be somewhere in a 30602856, somewhere there. Okay. For type of window. Worst case scenario, if you want to keep the window small, you can potentially use a uh, casement window that cranks in and out, that gives it more room and doesn't rely on one or more sashes to raise and close to give us that uh, minimum requirement. Okay. And check out over here. Looks like we got some where some water has gotten on the ground. Right, looks like we've got a little bit uh, where some water's got on the ground, but it looks the, the subfloor looks to be in pretty good shape. We'd want to go through and double check the subfloor thickness as well and make sure that it meets the requirements. It is 12 inch on center joist underneath, so our span rating uh, won't have to be a, as it would be with a typical 16 on center uh, joist section, but just want to make sure that that's a good three quarter subfloor. Uh, for the upstairs. So let's talk about insulation again up here. So again, we're, we've got some space confinements that we're dealing with. So either come in and foam this area uh, to give us our required R value for insulation and to meet the International Energy Conservation Code. Uh, or if you were thinking about doing bats, we might have to do some fur out to some additional material just to give us enough space and give us some breathing room for the roof. And then of course, if it's, a, if it's a batted roof, we'd probably have to go through and figure out a way to uh, get some roof ventilation here as well. Talking about energy codes, and of course, if you look at an old house that was built in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and some even in the early 70s, didn't have any insulation in them at all. And so what you traditionally found was a good dry uh, rafter cavity, wall cavity, whatever the cavity is that you were actually insulating. And then as, as some of the early energy codes came into play, uh, that weren't mandatory at the time, but it was more an industry-wide, uh, you'd go through and you'd have, you know, plastic visqueen on the walls or several different types of things to try to keep moisture out. But in fact, what really happened is warm in the winter side, cold in the, in the, in the air-conditioned side, you would form condensation, you would have uh, rot, mold, and mildew. The newer energy code has done a lot better job in dealing with some of those issues. And so the thought process behind that is, is if you can keep the air out, you also keep the moisture out. So the tighter you can make the home, the better. And so I think it's a great idea that y'all are talking about doing some spray foam. So that'll help alleviate a lot of those potentials for allowing that air and, and future moisture to come in. So it looks like we've got some areas where we had some water penetration coming through the old T111 siding. It doesn't appear to have any mold uh, associated with it, uh, but just simply discoloration uh, from that uh, water seeping in. Definitely think it should be an easy fix. Good to see you, Dan. Yeah, good to see you too. I'm excited about your project. So with that lesson on meeting building code, I met with my local inspector, Charles Hunter. While many building inspection offices can feel like obstacles, the staff in Lincoln County have been extremely friendly and helpful. They seem genuinely interested in my project and are already making suggestions on how to meet building code. So shout out to Nancy, Charles, and Michelle for all the help on that project so far. 
So we're in Fayetteville, Tennessee today in Lincoln County, and we just finished all the checklist stuff for our building permit. So right now we're heading to the zoning office for Lincoln County, and we're gonna get this done. Thank you. You're welcome. Got it. So I just wrapped up getting my building permit, and so now I just gotta get to construction on the shed. Thanks for joining me this week. I've had a lot of new subscribers, so thank you for sharing. Also had some requests for Patreon, Subscribestar, and Amazon links, and I'm working on setting those up. I have three major barriers ahead of me. Final grade on the site, pouring foundations, and framing. After that, I won't be so dependent on scheduling contractors, and week-to-week -week videos should be easier to produce. If you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to leave a comment. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode of Abandoned Shed to Tiny House. Am I, I don't know. Oh. <coughs> okay.